Transferring wealth successfully starts with asking yourself questions that will give your family a better life now and for generations to come. In this podcast, financial professionals John and Michael from Copper Beach Financial Group guide you through eye-opening questions to help you discover the truth about your wealth. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to The Truth About Wealth with John and Michael Paris of Copper Beach Financial Group. Gentlemen, how are you this afternoon? Doing well, Eric. How are you? I'm good. Michael, how are you? We have a little cold going. Well, you. you know. I'm hacking up a little bit of stuff here and there, but you know that's the time of, time <laughs> of year, right? Sharing. Yeah, you, you got it. So we'll keep we'll keep you on mute. Uh, we'll we'll handle today. We'll handle today. Just keep keep quiet. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, if we I, don't need if our I... listeners here and any uh, you know, anything untoward going on. Uh, that's, that's right. And well, the nice thing is we're social right. distancing, right? So you know, <laughs> right. you guys will be fine. You'll be safe. All right. We didn't talk about we didn't come here to talk about my health, gentlemen. Although that seems to have taken a turn. What are we talking about today? Today we're going to talk about risk and and what risk do families want to take and and this hmm. can go in a variety of avenues but we we thought that sort of with where we are today uh, with with the pandemic and with a recent election that just got done it just seems like a lot of the conversations we have with families are about are about risk in general hmm. and so we we thought that'd be a good time to not talk about any of those issues specifically, but just talk about risk in a in a family's wealth plan and what that means and some of the risks that maybe families should be thinking more about that perhaps aren't thinking about. So it's going to be a pretty general podcast today, but that's what we're talking about. Free free flow. I'm all right. Today. All right. I'm all about it. So is there good risk and bad risk? Yes. Um, okay. Yes, there is. When you, when you use the word risk in, in, in our language, we talk to families, it, it gets like 14 different directions mm-hmm. on what risk we're referencing. And typically when you look at planning, the, the risk is, first of all, not doing a plan and not focusing on the proper structure of your documents, the proper structure of your estate plan, your investment strategies. And so the, we, we start with the basics is you got to r- look at what you're doing sit with your advisors, reimagine what you're trying to accomplish uh, from a planning standpoint and, and just check it, be, be aware of where you're going and what's going on. We find a lot of folks that, that don't work with us have that concern where there's no one guiding them on ideas and concepts about how to keep themselves out of trouble. Mm-hmm. And one of the risks it always pops up with, with, with me and Michael, with, with families when they talk about their investments, they're always concerned about the markets. I mean, you've heard that, right, Eric? Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's been a bull market. It's going to go for, for a crash or whatever. So I have, a, I have a client recently said to me, before, actually before he became a client, said to me, before I came to you guys, I was real nervous about the market. I, you know, this was back in March. I bailed out of my portfolio and I went to cash. Now, what, what risk did he just take? One risk is he had tax risk. Mm. He didn't think about that. So I said, well, let me ask you a question. The gains in your portfolio over the last 10 years have been pretty substantial. He goes, oh yeah, I had a pretty good gain. So when you sold out of your portfolio, you just triggered a huge capital gain, short-term, long-term, depending on how long you held the positions. Did you do a tax analysis before you did that? And I got this blank stare. Mm -hmm. No. Well, my advisor never really never coached me on that. So the risk of jumping out of a market in this particular conversation today is, what's the tax tax risk involved? And I know people always get into the timing issue. I'm gonna gonna get out before it crashes and I'm gonna get back in before it goes up. Well, let me tell you, that doesn't work. You you have to guess twice. Mm -hmm. And most people aren't good enough to do that once, no less twice. So before you jump off the cliff when the markets get treacherous, be aware of there's also be a tax risk that you're not considering, which really erodes your performance over the last bull market, whatever it was. And it could be substantial. And I say to the clients, the, the, the risk we can manage are things like inflation risk. We can manage tax risk. We can manage in longevity risk, asset allocation risk, but we can't manage market risk, market cycle risk. Markets go up and down. They just it'll go straight up or straight down. They're always volatile depending on what time frame you're looking at. So you can control everything but market cycles. 
I always challenge them on when the markets go down, it's actually a buying opportunity and it's not a selling opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I get, I get these interesting looks. So I tell them you have extra cash, put it into the market. And, and that's really the, one of the risks that we always are up against all the time. Yeah. I think what you, that story you just brought up that really for me, what underlies that, that story is really uh, emotion. And that's, I think, when you're talking about risk and how to effectively evaluate risk, oftentimes what you're competing against is, are, are your own emotions. Mm -hmm. In this particular client, his emotion of seeing the stock market go down earlier this year, which, you know, listen, a lot of people are, are emotional about that. It's not a good thing to see. But again, getting back, how do you how do you properly evaluate that risk in the grand scheme of things? And what action should you or should not take in that sort of scenario? I often I think we've all heard of this sort of scenario. People have a fear of flying and because they perceive that the risk is so severe if something were something bad were to happen. However, of course, if you look at the data and the statistics, you're much more likely to be harmed in a car accident than you are flying in an airplane. But mm -hmm. most people don't have a fear of driving or, or I'm sure some people do not as much as a fear of flying. So it's it's almost that psychological element that we deal with every day that really underlies a lot of these decisions. And you, you certainly don't want to be uh, a robot when it comes to these decisions, but you don't want to oftentimes let your emotions sort of cloud your risk calculus, for lack of a better term. Yeah, yeah the one of the other risks we always bounce into, and I think we've done a podcast or two on this, is is your business risk. In other words, if you look at managing your company or your business, what risk is there when you do that? I mean, what's your daily risk? In our industry, the financial services industry, we have cyber risk potentially. Mm -hmm. uh, we have loss of key customer risk. We have employment practice risk. We hire employees. We have inflation risk in the way we operate as a business. So all these risks come into play. How do you manage those? Now, as you already know from previous podcasts, we have a private insurance structure that we manage some of this enterprise risk for our business to make sure we're, we're protected in case, you know, some come in and, and install information from our computer. We actually have a, a policy that protects us that they'll, they'll pay for all the expense associated with getting everything corrected. Mm -hmm. So, so you have to look at your business structure and say, what risk do I have running my business? And the other risk, and Michael could probably jump in here on four different levels, is that what risk you have managing your business and what if you're not here anymore? What, what's the impact? of that risk if you don't have a succession plan in place that guides the next level of family members or a partner or your spouse, what happens? So managing these risks on, on, a, on a daily basis can be daunting, but you know what? I always challenge our, our families. We, we're too busy working in the business than working on the business. Mm -hmm. We, we kind of push them to work on the business. And that's what we're referencing. Look at your business structure and say, how do I protect it? How do I build it? How do I manage it? How do I, how I move it to the next level? And those are the conversations that sometimes we're challenged to take time to, to, to really sit down and think about. But that's the push we do with our families. I think, I think the succession risk is the biggest one that I think Clearly. we wanted to talk about today that sometimes there's a, maybe my example of the fear of flying is an, an overly emotional response to risk or a perceived risk. I think sometimes for business owners, there's an underappreciation of the risk. Maybe that's associated with that succession plan or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. And what risk to the family results from a failure to really do that effectively. So I think the succession issue is is really key. I mean, if you look, I think, I think business owners particularly sole business owners really, really need to look at sort of what the business would look like without them, without them there managing it. We have a lot of our clients that have, would have a severe risk of losing significant value in their company were they to pass away or become disabled or something else were to happen to them that they've worked so hard building this really successful company. And it's it's unfortunate that they they don't pay enough attention to okay well what hap what happens to all of this value if something happens to me for my family for my kids that that is i think a, a huge risk that we wrestle with every day and how do you get a a family to really adequately pay attention to that risk is is sometimes a challenge out of curiosity just this is how my brain works do you see it's more of an issue with 
men that own businesses than women, because I know for myself for decades, I thought I was invincible, right? I think that's a a mentality a lot of guys have, and and maybe that might be a hindrance to the succession planning because no, I'm going to be, I'm fine. I'm going to live another 30, 40 years and I'm good. I, I'm going to test you on that. Let me give you my answer to that. Sure. I think women have a better position than men in most cases when it comes to the decision process. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you think about that, that, that comment, is that their experience in running families, they juggle 15 different things on a daily basis. And, and I go back to my life, my mom who raised us, I didn't have a father, if you recall from the first podcast, mm-hmm. and, and she, she did everything. And I watched how she operated. How, how the hell did she do that? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I look at Michael and his two kids, my, my two wonderful grandkids. I see what they do today with two parents, and they're running around crazy. My mm-hmm. mother had was all by herself with four of us. So, so the whole leadership of a family, leadership in a business, I think women are better suited to run things than men. Men get too... Uh, we're invincible. Yeah, it's like <laughs> yeah. it'll fix itself. It'll it'll take care of itself. I won't worry about that. Or you know what? I'll over. I'll 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 be I'll be over paranoid, and they uh, they affect things. Women have a have a calmness about them, and I, I I would I would probably love this to to do a, some kind of an analysis or study to see in a certain situation who would perform better a man or a female. I I bet I bet a thousand bucks on the female. Well, anytime. It's, it's funny you mentioned that, Eric, because I had a conversation with. Um, someone in my, uh, in my peer group. And I was talking to them about, about business succession with, with their company. And his response that he gave me was, well, you know, I I don't have time to do that. I'm I'm just worried about growing my company right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have, I don't have time to focus on that. And we said, well, that's, that's more reason you need to focus on it. You're not, you know, because you're growing a successful company. It should, as you said, dad, working on the business sometimes as opposed to solely working in the business is uh, is a challenge. So I, I think I would echo both of your statements. Sometimes men have maybe more of a, a difficult time with that. But I, I've seen women that have had difficult times with it as well. I think it, it may be for different reasons. If I now, had to pick, I think it'd be more men. Now you know my vote. Because <laughs> I, had, I had experience with it. I mean, I mean, I, I mean if, if my mom was here, I'd vote for president. <laughs> All right. So how do you guys get somebody to sit down and actually make the decision to create a succession plan, you know, get them over that hump of either they think they're invincible or they don't have time. Like you said, Michael. Oh, that's a good, that's a good question. It does depend on the, on the family. Uh, one, one, of the, one of the successful things that, that we've done, I, I think if you, if you ask the business owner by his or herself, if we're in a one-on-one conversation with them, I think it's harder. I, I think when you get the spouse, involved yes, I agree. in that conversation, it tends to take a little bit of a different turn because the spouse oftentimes isn't thinking as much about that as well, but they are certainly probably more concerned with with that uh, plan and being put in place, again, to protect the value of the company going to him or her where something happened to the business mm-hmm. owner. So I think we've been successful in, in when you talk with spouses together, that tends to move the needle, I think, a little bit more. Yeah, we uh, we just recently had a conversation with one of our clients where he realized that if he passed away, he didn't have a succession to his business. He has a young individual that is coming up in the ranks, is doing a great job, but he admittedly said he's not capable of running the business if I left tomorrow. So therefore, the value of my company would drop precipitously. So what's the true value of his company? Well, it's not the valuation that's necessarily... The question mark is how much do you want to protect that value to your family? Mm. And we talked about having a life insurance structure that protected him and his family for that value. Then we got in the conversation of, well, how much value do you want to calculate for your spouse? Because remember, if you die today, it's, it's, it's a value A, but if you survive another 10 years and keep building your business value, what are you insuring? 10 years from now, five years from now, or today. Mm -hmm. So that's a discussion we go back and forth with. How much do you want to have your wife get and protected by a a number that's not going to risk the family? And if the company sold for half price, that's all well and good. Or if it just goes away because you're not there, that's all well and good. Or if your young associate comes in and says, listen, I'll buy the business from you, and they pay your wife a salary for the next 10 years. All, All those options are on the table, but the clear solid 
option would be I just have a life insurance policy in place that if I die tomorrow, my wife, my wife gets X. And they said, I could sleep now. I could sleep nice because I know that's in place. Yeah, I think that's a definitely a short-term triage type of fix to protect that. Absolutely. And I, th- I think there's a short-term way of dealing with that and then a more of a longer-term way, which is, you know, in that example, making sure that the succession plan between those two individuals, the senior business owner and the junior associate is is nurtured and and to try to minimize that. So there's it's a never ending process very often for most business owners, making sure that that succession plan is constantly being nurtured and just grows over time. Because, you know, that ideally in that situation, you want to, if you do put that life insurance contract in place and the succession plan long term is protected, now you, now the family has both assets, which is, that's nice. Dad, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the other risks that our families tend to either, I don't want to say not appreciate as much, but maybe that they're not thinking about all the time. Let's talk a little bit about asset protection risk. Yeah, we've had a couple of podcasts on asset protection concepts, and, and it, it is a big risk. It's a big risk that you've accumulated all these all these assets, and and they're subject to claims of creditors. We we often joke about we call them in laws and outlaws. So uh-huh. when when you when you set up your estate plans, when you set up your your business structures, you all you have to be make sure that they're all designed to protect the family from those those wonderful people that might go after your money. We had an attorney speak at one of our conferences. He said, if you have more than, I think he said a million dollars, I think he said you have a 90% chance, or was it a 60% chance, you'll be sued by someone because you have wealth. So it's, it's an interesting stat. I don't know how, how, how serious that number is, but, but it's, a, it's a message that when you create wealth, people are, are, have a tendency to look at that wealth saying, hey, listen, there's a bucket of cash I can go after. So how you structure your entities, how you, how you put things in trust, how you segregate assets are very, very important that part of the equation. Insurance also plays a role in that too, as a, you know, from a liability protection standpoint, I think that's one thing we see a lot of families don't have enough of is this umbrella coverage or something along those lines really to just protect against that eventuality, because it's one of those things that most families aren't thinking about every day. And we don't think about it every day, but it is a really, really serious thing that God forbid that were to happen would really cause some turmoil in the family. So that's important to think about uh, as well. I think what you brought up on the estate planning documents is really key to dad with, with regard to uh, generational asset protection and using trusts. And you know, we've had a, quite a few podcasts, I think in the past on how those can be structured. And sometimes a lot of families are uh, afraid of going down that route because they either, either don't understand how they operate or they're concerned with maybe there being too much asset protection and then the family isn't able to get access to those assets over time, which, which isn't the case if it's designed properly. Those are some of the risks. You know, that's an example I think of over, of over or being overly emotional about a risk uh, with the asset protection being too strict. That's a, a risk that a lot of families should, should pay more attention to and really explore with their advisors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the other part of that, the risk is communication risk to your family or family members, is understanding what's going to happen, how, how it all gets layered in to the next generation. When you think about what risk occurs with that is the misunderstanding of information. Like I remember back in, I think, in, again, the first first or second podcast, my, my, my mom and my sister had a conversation about a certain asset that my mother said, sell it for this price, don't sell for anything less than that. But the value of that asset was worth a lot less than the price my mom thought it was. Mm-hmm. And I went through this gyration with my sister and fought over that we have to probate the estate and it wasn't, it, it wasn't worth that much because we had creditors, we had to pay people off, and she refused to sell the asset until she got that value. And it caused me a 27 year loss of my sister because of a communication that wasn't properly addressed. And and it happens, we see it a lot with families that, you know, kids say, well, mom promised me this or dad promised me that. And how come you got this? How come you got that? So the more you could establish a focus on how things are going to be distributed to your children, it limits the fighting. It limits that risk of losing the relationship between um, um, children 
children as you as you're no longer here because when the core of the family goes when mom and dad pass there's nothing that keeps the kids together except the kids yeah. so the more you can layer the strategy with your mission statements with your legacy letters the values that you transfer to your kids we just did that podcast which is a couple of weeks ago but but it's all comes into play and manages that risk because we don't want to ever see our 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 generations fight with each other because a breakdown in communication i think that's one of the biggest risks our clients discuss with us that they're most concerned about how do i teach my children or how do i get my children to understand these values or kids are different today. I'm sure you've heard that, Eric. Younger kids are different today than you and when you and I were raised. And generationally, you know, I'm in my 60s and my daughter's in her 30s, so is Michael. And we're three different, we're, we're like three different generations. We don't sometimes are not on the same page with things. And that's, that's just a general issue, generational issue. But it's real. So the more you can get that communication the, uh, in, in focus, the better. Yeah, I'm glad you remembered I was still in my 30s. That makes yeah, me feel... He's, he's getting old. I'm getting close to not <laughs> he's, getting, he's getting old. He's getting out there. Yeah, I, I think uh, that's that That was all a really, really great point there. Yeah, the, the communication issue is, you know, again, I think about properly analyzing that risk. I think that that's a, another example where a family maybe perhaps doesn't fully anal or appreciate that risk. And again, we've talked about that study from the Institute for Preparing Heirs. I think we've mentioned it <laughs> maybe on every podcast because I think it's such a good study. But it's important. It, it, but when you when you look at how families fail to transfer wealth successfully between generations, the, the major reasons are a lack of communication and a lack of, of preparing their heirs for the wealth that they're going to inherit. The families need to be aware of that risk because it is a, it's a big one that very often they aren't thinking about because they're either not trained to think about it, which is why families hire us because we help, we help push that needle as well. That is, a, that is a really key, it's a key risk. What about tax risk? Oh, my favorite topic. <laughs> we, we mentioned it earlier in the podcast, but but taxes are always an important topic with our families as far as how much they pay, uh, how much they can preserve in tax, doing tax planning, how do we transfer wealth on a tax efficient basis. And when, when you look at all those components, tax, uh, tax, taxes play a very important role in our planning forever. And if you look at just what's gone on with the election and changing uh, hats, uh, it appears that the Biden's going to be there, our next president. He's already talking about tax increases and we have a t $27 trillion deficit and all these fears we talked about earlier, all these concerns that families have, how's that going to affect me? How can I protect my family against all these erroneous taxes? If, if I, if, if I don't watch what, what's, what's happening, you remember, it's not what you make, it's what you keep. And that's mm -hmm. the strategy we always kind of lay out there. We help our families keep more of what they make. And again, we don't do anything that's outside of the tax laws. We do things within the tax laws. But you'd be surprised at how many clients that don't understand the tax code and things that they could take, take, take advantage of in a legal way. And And, and when you look at uh, again, I don't want to uh, offend any CPA might be listening to this podcast, but most CPAs are tax preparers, not tax planners. And it's a struggle when you get in that environment because most clients think, well, if my CPA didn't suggest it to me, then it's not available. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily always true. And it's nothing, you know, your CPA is great, but he might not be trained in the tax planning arena. That's a very specialized part of the, the tax code that, that we spend a lot of time with our families on and we work with their advisors and we work as part of that team and we bring ideas to the table to preserve taxes. I think you bringing up the the accounting teams is is a good is a really good point, and I I think it's it's interesting when from our experience in working with a lot of advisors in a lot of different arenas uh, with a lot of families that the, the the tax planning side of things does sometimes get pushed on the back burner, unfortunately. But I think a lot of times. Families, I think, when again, when you're talking about risk, I think it's important for them to, again, what risk do you want to take? And when it comes to tax planning, there's a balance that families have to, I think, always abide by where am I taking advantage of all of the tax planning tools that are available to me? And where is that line drawn? Or where am I going too far? And we see some advisors and families that err 
too too far on the conservative side, and I think that they don't necessarily look at both sides of that ledger because, you know, what we have to sometimes put in perspective is that, and that's again perfectly fine if you do not want to go down that route. But if you go down that route, you have a one hundred percent chance of paying those tax dollars. Mm -hmm. So do you? What risk do you want to take? Do you want to do you want to pay a hundred percent of the taxes, or do you want to? Do, do you want to take a, a, a maybe a different track and work on lowering that again completely legitimately but do you want to go down that route and sometimes the advisors have to i think kind of w lay those options out for the family let the family decide a little bit more yeah and it goes back to the investment risk i mentioned earlier i'll give you a scenario i, I think in one of the podcasts we talk about we ask a, a very simple question to to a, a new client and it goes like this. When you look at your portfolio returns last year, what was your net deposit rate of return at the end of the year? And I get blank stares. They don't even know what that is. Mm -hmm. And basically what that means, if you recall, Eric, is you got a rate of return in your portfolio minus your fees you're being charged by the uh, mutual funds or investments that you're working with. Then your advisor charges you a fee. But the biggest cost is your tax cost. Because remember, mm -hmm. unless it's in an IRA, any gains in that portfolio are subject to a capital gain tax on those earnings, whether it's short, short term or long term tax taxation issues. Managing that's critical. And, and, here's, and here's how simple it gets. The more you can preserve in taxes, the more you, your account value will grow. It's a compounding effect that if I could save a client $100 in taxes and invest it properly for the future, that 100 could go to 500 so every dollar we save a family in taxation, whether it's the estate tax, whether it's uh, income tax strategies, or whether it's investment returns for capital gains, and when you look at all those components, tax have a big risk in family wealth depletion. So the more we preserve, the, the more we can grow, the more we can create wealth for the generations. Guys, this has been fantastic. I mean, obviously, I always like spending time with you. I always learn something new. But I am going to try to help the audience reduce a risk that you didn't talk about. You ready? Yes, sir. Okay. The risk of not doing anything. And yes. I think that that's yeah. a huge thing that, that people just get stagnant, procrastination. Yeah. They just don't make a move. So let's eliminate that risk right now. How do they reach out to talk to you and just been a, begin a conversation? That, that probably should have been the first risk we talked about. Thank you. <laughs> I got that covered. <laughs> <laughs> so our, you can you can contact us uh, if you want to give us a call. Our, our phone number at the office is area code 856-988-8300. And our website is www.cbfgllc.com. Perfect. And the nice thing is that's the easiest risk to eliminate right now, just by reaching yes. out and talking to the team at Copper Beach. Guys, great podcast today. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Eric. Feel better. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah likewise. I'll work on Feel that. I'll, I'll try to eliminate that risk with the doctor. So uh, there you go. <laughs> I'll talk to, talk to him tomorrow. All right. And the last thank you, of course, goes to you, listening audience. Thank you for tuning in and listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast with John and Michael Paris. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when John and Michael come out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at Copper Beach Financial Group, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Copper Beach Financial Group. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. This material is for informational purposes only. Neither APFS nor its representatives provide tax, legal, or accounting advice. Please consult your own tax legal or accounting professional before making any decisions. Copper Beach is not affiliated with American Portfolios Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolios Advisors, Inc. Securities offered through American Portfolio Financial Services, Inc., a member of FINRA SIPC, Investment Advisory and Financial Planning Services offered through American Portfolio Advisors, Inc., an SCC Registered Investment Advisor. These opinions are subject to change at any time without notice. 
Any comments or postings are provided for informational purposes only and do not constitute an offer or a recommendation to buy or sell securities or other financial instruments. Readers should conduct their own review and exercise judgment prior to investing. Investments are not guaranteed, involve risk, and may result in a loss of principal. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Investments are not suitable for all types of investors. Copper Beach is an unaffiliated entity of American Portfolios Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolios Advisors, Inc. Any opinion expressed in this forum is not the opinions of American Portfolio Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolio Advisors, Inc. and have not been reviewed by the firm for completeness or accuracy.